Over the course of the quarter, we've been discussing a bunch of concepts like phonemes and morphemes and syntax trees. And you must be wondering, how do we know any of this is real? The answer is that during decades, scientists have observed linguistic behavior, collected data, and performed experiments to try to figure out what is the organization of language in the human mind. This is the field of study of psycholinguistics, which studies how language is instantiated in our minds and ultimately in our brains. It also studies language acquisition, which are the steps we take to learn a language. So yes, as I mentioned, psycholinguistics is, uh, mainly studies these two subfields, how language is acquired, uh, either as an L1 by babies or as an L2 by babies or adults, meaning first or second language. It also studies how your brain perceives language and how it produces language when you speak or sign. Let's start with perception and production. So our brain is like a black box, like there's no way for us to figure out what exactly your mind and your brain are doing. So um, in order to figure out how language is instantiated in you, we need to do experiments where we can observe some linguistic behavior, how you react to a word, how you move your eyes to words, and so forth. Um, given contemporary technologies, we can also directly image the brain to see how your blood flow is going through your brain when you present at stimuli, what kind of electromagnetic fields you have, and so forth. I want to show you an example of a behavioral experiment. Let's say I sit you in front of this uh, screen and ask you to look at the words that I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you a sequence of English words. And all you have to do is tell me if what you see is a real word of English, yes or no. So I'm going to show you a word in English, pay attention to the screen and tell me, is this, is this a real word of English? Yes or no? So the, the first question you need to be asking yourself is, what exactly did I just see? So you're probably seeing the word window, in which case you would say that yes, this is an English word. And the word window is the one that's, that lingers in there the longest. But if you pay attention to what I'm showing you, you're going to see that there's like some blur before the word window. What I'm doing is that I'm actually showing you two words. The first one, which is going to be there for a short time, is called the prime. And the second one, which is there for the longest and you are consciously seeing it, is the target. So here the target is the word window, which will stay there for between one and two seconds. But the one that looks kind of a blur, the prime, is wonder in this one. Can you try to see the, the word wonder before the word window? Hmm. Now that you know what you're looking for, it's kind of visible, isn't it? So this experiment is called, this type of experiment is called priming. We are studying how seeing a word influences your reactions for subsequent words. So for example, if you see wonder, is that going to have any effect on how you answer to whether uh, window is a word of English or not? You're probably always going to say that it is a word of English, but maybe your speed will be uh, different. In the experiment, what the person would need to do is sit in front of a keyboard and press a yes or a no. And this will take time for their finger to reach the button. We call this the reaction time. So if you see wonder, wonder for 50 milliseconds and then see window for about two seconds, your mind is not going to be conscious of seeing wonder, but it will be processed in the back of your mind. And while it's doing that, the next word, the target, is going to enter your mind as well. So you're going to have different reaction times with different combinations of primes and targets. Let's uh, look at a couple of examples. If the, the prime, the word that gets displayed for 50 milliseconds, is song, and then you match it with the target mrabel, this reaction is going to be fairly slow because the brain has to look through all of its words to see if Mirabel exists and it's going to say that it doesn't. And the correct answer is going to be no, but it is going to take the longest time because the brain has to exhaustively look through everything. If you have the prime song and then you combine it with the target panda, this is still going to be slow, but it's going to be a little bit faster 
than this than the first one. And this is because panda does exist. So it's going to react to a real word, word but still one that is unrelated to song. There's really not connection, no connection between the two. What about if you pair song with song? This is going to be the fastest reaction because when you see the prime, the word song will be active in your mind. It will be like opening a file on a computer. And then when you see a song for the second time, it's going to take a shorter time for you to access that file and bring it into memory. So you're going to say that, yes, song is a word much faster than you would to panda because the, the file that contains song is already active in your brain. The most interesting case is the combination of song and music. This one is going to be somewhere in between these two. It's going to, um, it's not going to be as rapid as song because it's a different word, but it'll be faster than panda. Why? Because song and music are related. They are semantically related. So if you open the file for song, it's going to open the file for song, but a bunch of other files that are semantically connected to it, including music. So music is going to get a little boost when it is activated as the target. So you can see that this provides mathematical and tangible reality for concepts like the mental lexicon, for, an, for the idea that words are connected amongst themselves. That if you see the word song, you are indeed activating song and its hypernyms, like music, because you get that little extra boost from the prime when answering to the pair song music. So this is a type of behavioral experiment because we look at your reaction from a stimulus. You have a stimulus from the screen that enters your eyes, goes to your brain, and then you have a response which has to go through your fingers into the keyboard. You are examining some behavior that you have. And this is just one example of a type of behavioral experiment. Uh, there's experiments that involve eye tracking, which follows your eyes as you read. And there's judgments of sentences, for example, saying if a sentence is well formed or not. We use these in syntax, for example. All of these, again, observe behavior. So they observe your brain indirectly by your behaviors. We can also look at the brain directly. We can look at things like blood flow in magnetic resonance imaging or MRI. We can look at the electric field emanating from your brain as your neurons think. We use EEG or encephalo electroencephalography. Or we can use a device like MEG, magnetic resonance imaging, to look at the electromagnetic field coming out of parts of your brain. And we can use these instruments, for example, to know that there are indeed specific parts of your brain that are engaged when you are processing linguistic information. We also know that morphemes are real because every time your mind has to break up a word into morphemes, it has a little hiccup, like a little uh, pause, in its, uh, like a little break in its electric field because it's expecting the word to continue and bloop, it actually has to break it to process a different morpheme. So all these provide tangible evidence that the phenomena we have studied in the last few weeks do have some degree in reality in people's minds. So psycholinguistic experiments are used for a whole, uh, for, throughout the field of linguistics. We have already talked about language acquisition, which is the study of how uh, language learning goes. It could be by uh, adults, but the focus has historically been on how children acquire their first language. And as we have seen, there's different theories for how this is done. Maybe they learn it through by cobbling together all of their cognitive power, or maybe they do it because they have something innate to language that gives them a little boost when learning. Um, what we know for a fact is that there are different stages in how children display their linguistic abilities. For example, it's um, in between four and eight months, they start babbling, producing combinations of consonants and vowels, like ba or duh. And it takes them about a year to produce single words, like dog or mama. We have a very interesting phenomenon here, which is that they overgeneralize with their words. So they would use a word like dog to refer to any household animal or any animal in general. In between one and two years, they get basic syntax. So they have uh, trees that are that have very basic connections and only contain two terminal nodes, like more milk or daddy up. 
between two or three years, they can they get more syntax and have expressions that are maybe three words long, like mommy give toy or I go now. But as you can see, these are already full inflectional phrases. They continue to overgeneralize. So this is the stage where they make uh, errors like um, I write it a letter or um, I read it a book, where they try to make the past tense as it would in every other verb. They try to overgeneralize to the verbs that are irregular, like read or wrote. So what they're doing is applying their intellect to try to um, extrapolate patterns and try to apply those patterns as aggressively as possible to all of the words. Most of the time it will work, sometimes it won't, like with the irregular verbs. Finally, when they get to three to four years, you're going to see a more complete acquisition of syntax. So you're going to get more complex phrases with uh, CPs, for example, like, please can I go now, or mommy is coming home. So these are stages uh, that are followed during language acquisition. Sign language follows a completely similar process. And these are the fields that are studied by psycholinguistics. They study how people acquire and use language. And they use observation of the patterns in children, for example, or experimentation to try to deduce how language is instantiated in their mind and brain. And it is connected to other fields like psychology and cognitive science.